guys. And uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn over to turn over to Mark chapter number five. Mark chapter number five. And uh, and so let's let's stand if you would out of respect for the reading of God's word. And uh, in just a little bit, uh, we're we're gonna uh, have our invitation, of course. And at the end, uh, we're gonna do something for the uh, the group. We'll take up a love offering for them. And then make sure that you go by their product table. I know they've got CDs and stuff out there that helps to get them down the road and uh, to put gas in the bus. And uh, and so I know when I traveled in evangelism, a lot of times that that money that came in off of that table would would be what would keep us and sustain us. But uh, Mark chapter number five. Now, there's a lot of things going on in this chapter. And, uh, and so I, I guess if I were to title the sermon today, it would be when, when we're all done, God's not. When we're all done, God's not. Sometimes we, we get done and we think, well, God's done because we're done. But, 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 but that doesn't mean that God's done just because you're done. And so Mark chapter five, there's, there's four key elements to this story, if you will. First of all, there's a man with a demon. And, uh, <clears throat> and so this man has got, he's demon possessed and, uh, he's running around naked in the, in the cemetery. He's, he's, he's attempting suicide. He's cutting himself. He's, the doctors have tried to help him. The laws tried to help him. Psychiatrists have tried to help. Nobody can help the guy. He, he's a suicidal, literal maniac running around and call him the maniac of Gadara, uh, running around in the land of the Gadarenes living in a cemetery. Now I know dead people can't hurt you, but dead people can make you want to hurt yourself. I don't like being around dead bodies. I really don't. I do lots of funerals, but when we go back in the prep room and I'm helping with things sometimes as, I, as a pastor, you have to do that, uh, uh, at least with the funeral homes that I try to help out sometimes. Uh, uh, that, that's not my, so there's a man with a demon. Then, then there's a man that's depressed and his name's Jarius. His daughter's about to die. There's a woman with a disease that has an issue of blood. And then there's a little girl that ends up being dead. So this, this story has got a lot of elements in one chapter. There's a lot of things going on. But in all of these cases, God is enough. It, no matter it was a demon-possessed man or a, diseased little, or a diseased woman or a dead little girl or a depressed daddy, every time Jesus was enough. And I don't know what you walked in with this morning, but you can walk out with Jesus being enough. You say, but you don't know my life story. I don't have to know your life story because I know the one who can rewrite your story. He can write a brand new story for you this morning. And so I figure if we can sing from the 90s, I can preach from the 90s. Amen. So, so we, we can, and man, I mean, this, I mean, just putting this army thing up gives me a little hooah this morning. And, uh, and so, man, I get a little bit uh, motivated. So let, let's look here in, in, in chapter five. We'll read a few verses. It says, and they came over to the other uh, side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, this is Jesus, immediately they met him one out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. That means he had a mother-in-law. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when Jesus, uh, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. He cried with a loud voice and said, uh, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. And he said, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he said, what is thy name? And we know that he answered legion. He cast the demons out. They went into the pigs. The pigs ran to the beach. That's why I don't go, I like to go to the beach. But no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just full of jokes today. No, but they ran down and they drowned themselves. You know the story well. Now let's look at the next part. Now, now follow along with me. And then... And, and they came to Jesus and seeing that he was possessed with the devil in verse number 15. Now he's, he's clothed and sitting in his right mind. And, and, and they were afraid. And when they saw it, they told him how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and concerning the swine. And they, they asked him to leave. So Jesus does this miracle, but they don't want Jesus to really change things. See, the problem is sometimes we want Jesus to, to come in. We want to add Jesus to what we got, not let Jesus change us. You don't add Jesus to your life. You make Jesus your life. You give Jesus your life. You, you, don't, you don't write the amount you want to give him. You just sign the bottom and say, Lord, it's all yours. You fill in the contract. So, so, so they were concerned about this. Now look down a little bit further, verse number 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly and said, my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come 
and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Now you know the story, I'm paraphrasing because I can't read the whole chapter to you and get through the sermon today. And so, so she comes up, she touches the hem of his garment, immediately she's healed and she had spent all that she had trying to go to doctors. No doctor could help her but she got healing there from Jesus. Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? And, uh, and then remember the old song, and then crying with knees trembling, she she said, Master, it is I, for I knew if I could just touch your clothes, I wouldn't have to die. So she touched the hem of his garment. Then look, let's look on down a little bit further. And as he cometh to the house of the ruler of synagogue and seeth uh, the tumult and, and them that wept greatly, and when they came in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel's not dead, but she's asleep. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he put them out, he taketh the father and the mother and the damsel of them that were with him and entered into the, uh, where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and he said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was of the age of 12 years and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Father in heaven, I pray that you would speak to our hearts the next few minutes. God, I pray that your word would come alive. Lord, I pray as we consider, Lord, how powerful you are and how no matter what the circumstance is, God, you have the answer. You are the answer to our problems. You are the answer to life's questions. And Lord, I pray that we would trust you. Lord, I pray that we would walk with you. Lord, I pray that we would experience you today as never before. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be saved. Seated. So this is a tragedy. And Jarius, when he was facing this tragedy, he sought the Lord. Can I say this, that you will always find yourself in a bad place when you go to the world looking for answers that need to come from God. Sometimes we go to a source that doesn't have the answers. If you'll go to God, he has the answer. His word has the answer for us. And so, so they go to Jesus and, and, and he begins to work with them. He, he didn't go to Oprah and he didn't go to Dr. Phil and he didn't go on a talk show and he didn't even diagnose himself on the internet. I mean, a lot of times we like to self die I mean, I've got 14 times of cancer, but the time I look at Google and figure, every time my foot hurts, I figure out I've got, come on now, don't act like y'all do that either. And uh, you do the same thing, but he went to God. And finally, while he was on his way, if you remember how the story goes, that the elders came to him and said, Lord, you don't even need to come now. Don't, don't worry about this. Don't sweat this. Because if, if you remember, they said, Lord, uh, don't trouble. She's already dead. She's already died. There's no need for you to come the rest of the way. But Jesus said, believe in faith, and he said, be not afraid. I like to hang around people that aren't afraid of the world, but they trust in the Lord. And I think this is really a tightrope of trust right here because they knew, and you can cheer yourself up today, that God is still in control. And he came and he worshiped first and then he made his request. I think sometimes that we, we want to make the request first and not worship. And we worship on the condition that our request is, is, is answered and our prayer is answered. Can I just say this? It is always right to worship. Whether you feel like it or not. I just don't feel like going to church today. Then you need to go to church. Because your feelers broke. Tweet that. Amen. Your feelers, bro, you should. If you don't feel it, that's not a reason not to go. That's a reason to go so God can speak to you. And so everybody's praying. And finally they come up and they said, there's no use to pray. It's too late. She's dead. And I mean, can you imagine how bad this looked? But if you remember what I said, when we're all done, God's not. When we're all finished with all of our answers and if we tried everything that we can, God's still not done. Uh, the, 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 the old saying is, it's not over till God says it's over. So you say, well, Pastor Mark, what's going on in this story? Let me give you just a few things this morning. I realize it's about 18 minutes till 12. I'm going to try to get there by that time. And uh, so you just stay with me. Don't check your watches. I'll keep you informed. You got lots of, I mean, we, we, I mean we're going to make it. First of all, when we're done, God's not when it comes to people being saved. This man is in about as bad a shape as you can get. He's demon-possessed. 
He's suicidal. He's been tied up, put in jail, brushes with the law. I mean, everybody's given up on this guy, except for Jesus. Now, if you remember what happened right before this, this passage, I've always loved this story. It's one of my favorites in the Bible. It's one of my favorite illustrations. And, and across all campuses today, we're preaching out of Mark chapter five. And it's one of my favorites because here, here's what's going on. There's a storm on the sea. And I mean, it's, it, it, and Jesus, remember, comes out of the boat and says, peace be still. And the storm stops and, and all that's going on. Now, stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. And all of a sudden, Jesus calms the storm. Maybe that demoniac was up on the hill. Up, up on the graveyard and he looks out there and he goes, man, whoever just stopped that storm, maybe he could stop my storm. Maybe that's why I ran to Jesus. Have you, have you thought about that? The storm that's raging out there, we have a storm sometimes inside of us. And not everybody can see it, but we can feel it. And you shook hands this morning and you put on your, hey man, brother, glory to God, I'm glad to be here, but inside you got a storm and you're sitting by your wife, but every time you try to hold her hand, she's going. And there's a storm. Sometimes we feel those storms. But when it comes to people being saved, when you're done and you don't think they can ever be saved, have you ever seen somebody that God saved and you just didn't think anybody could do it? Eugene, six foot four, 300 pounds, Tattoos from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. Prison tats. Top of his head to the sole of his feet. Shaved his head, big ball headed guy. Had the Grim Reaper on the inside of his arm. Said HIV positive. Shared a needle. Had AIDS. Was angry at the world. Done hard time in prison. His wife came and got saved. Actually girlfriend, they were living together at the time. We got him married. As time went on. But they, they're, they're living together. She said, she'd come forward and fall out on that altar begging. I need, I, I, I'd go over there and try to witness to him. I'd knock on his door. He had, he, the first time he said, come in, I sat down. I was talking to him a little bit. And, and, I, and, and he's like, man, he said, have you been in the army? Because I keep my hair cut short. I just keep my hair cut short so you can't see how gray headed I am. And uh, that's the only reason. And, and so, but I, I keep my hair cut short. And he said, were you in the army? I said, well, I just, I happened to be in the army. And we talked about army a little bit. And I said, well, hey, I want to talk to you about something more important than that. I want to talk to you about the Lord. He started cussing me, yelling at me, threw a beer can at me, and I left the house. You say, well, what'd you do? I bet you never went back there. The next Saturday, man, his wife came to church on Sunday and she goes, I'm sorry for what Eugene did. She's bawling, she's crying. She throws herself on the floor. She's sobbing. She's asking God to do something great in his life. She said, well, you come back and see my husband again. I thought, man, and I tried not to all day Saturday and finally my car turned in there again because I knew he needed the Lord. I went in there. I, I came in, I sat down. His wife let me in. I sat down. He's, he's already got a beer open. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. He's already, there's a can of, cans of beer around the house. He's already slamming them. Man, I started witnessing to him. He got mad at me, started yelling at me, cussing at me threatening me, runs me out of the house again. I just kept going back. He kept yelling, cussing. Finally, I'd just walk in the door. He'd stand up on the couch and say, get out of here. I just kept going. Finally, as time went on, an amazing thing happened. He showed up at church one Sunday. He showed up at church one Sunday and Man, I gave the invitation and this guy run out the back door of that church so fast there was not an opportunity at all for me to ever talk to him. I got outside, he is shaking so bad, smoking a cigarette right outside the door of the church. I couldn't tell if it was a nicotine fit or conviction or both. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You're shaking a little bit right now. But um, I said, Eugene, he ran, he said, I want to talk to you. He went and got in his car. Came back that night. I'll never forget, so it's, it's one of my favorite stories. If you've heard me tell before, act like it's brand new. We were having services outside that night. We took all the chairs in the church and we took them out and set them outside and, the, and, and we had service under the stars, we called it. It's in the fall. About that time, he comes and shows up that night and we were having a testimony service and we had our, out, you know, we had our instruments outside and we were singing and stuff and all of a sudden, he said, I was having testimonies and he holds his hand up. I'd never heard this guy talk without cussing. In fact, later on, after he got saved, I was standing in the lobby of the church one day shaking hands. He comes by and he goes, Pastor Mark, one blank of a message. <laughs> Took him a little while to get sanctified. You say, well, what'd you do when he did that? I said, blank, yeah, it was, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm kidding, I didn't really do that. 
I didn't do that. Some of y'all just swallowed your gum. <clears throat> you shouldn't have been chewing it anyway. You were smacking it. And I'll never forget. But he stood up that night, and I'm thinking he's gonna, and he said, the Lord saved me. I went home and got saved, and man, I never thought God could save him. I went over there, Brother Gary, but I didn't believe God could save him. I didn't believe God could change him. When it comes to sinners being saved, when you're all done, God's not done yet. You say, but I've got a son who's running from God. I've got a daughter. And by the way, sometimes the, the ones that concern me the most are the ones who know how to act like they're Christians, who know how to act like church, who know how to act like they know what's going on, who, who have this form of godliness that deny the power thereof, who, who, who do with their lips do him service, but their heart is far from them. And you as a parent see that they're not real. And you're like, can God ever save them? Can I say that he can? Can I say that he can? Uh, John Mix, John Mix preached here, and big old tall guy, Yankee from Illinois, and I mean, he's Yankee from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. I remember the yeah, I, I, first time I preached for John Mix's pastor that led him to the Lord. He led him to the Lord on soul winning. And he was telling about baptizing John, and, and, and it, was, it was cold in the winter, and they were baptizing him, and they were baptizing in a stock tank at this church. And they had a sheet. It was just a little storefront church in, in, in Peoria, Illinois. And there was a sheet that was pulled across, just literally a bed sheet that they had pulled across a, a, a thing and they were getting baptized. And so John showed up to get baptized. They said, you need to bring some clothes to change into. You're going to get baptized. John, I'm not kidding. His pastor said he showed up in a Speedo. No T-shirt or nothing. He said, all of a sudden, John walked out. And you got to, I mean, this guy's a big old boy. John, his finger's missing on one hand, about half of his finger. He comes walking out with no shirt and a Speedo on. That preacher said he looked at him and went, oh, dear God, what am I going to do? <laughs> so I'll tell you what he did. He said, now, hold on, John, I'm going to give you my T-shirt. So John tells it, he goes, man, he took his shirt off and he, he preached like me. He's all sweaty. His T-shirt's dry. He said, I put on his stinky T-shirt. And he said, he's like a medium. He said, I had to work into that shirt. So he said, now I've got a Speedo and a spandex shirt on. <laughs> they put him in the water. He stepped in the water. It didn't have a heater. Now, remember, I said it was stock tank, winter, Illinois. No heater. Bubba, the preacher said he let out a string of cuss words that would have embarrassed a sailor. <laughs> newly converted. I'm not giving you a right to curse. I'm just saying newly converted. He said, everybody in the church heard it. They started snickering because it was a sheet. He said, when he baptized John, he didn't know if it took or not. John's been pastoring in Washington, D.C. now. And Pastor Luke and I have been out there and preached for him. He took a church from 20, 30 people, and he's running several hundred people now, reaching people with the gospel. People that nobody thought would ever be saved. Nobody in John's family was saved. He didn't have saved parents. He didn't have saved relatives. He, but, but God saved him. You see, the good news to this story is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your background is. What matters is what's going to happen in your future. And if you don't come to Christ, I can tell you what your future is. It's separation from God, and it's a place called hell. But boy, if you'll give your heart and life to Jesus, heaven isn't just, I mean, it's awesome, but it's not just the best part. The best part is I could just spend every day with Jesus. From now till I get there. You see, some people just get saved to die and go to heaven. You didn't get saved to die. God saved you so you could live for him and live that abundant life. Let's hurry on. When we're done, God's not when it comes to supplying our needs. This woman has an issue of blood. She spent every penny she has. If you study the book of Leviticus, you find out what this issue of blood is. It's a, 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 when a woman would have a child in the Old Testament under Levitical law. If after the baby was born that her fountain the, the, didn't dry up after 14 days, she had to be put without the camp as a leper. She was cast out. She had to be away from her family. She had to be away from her friends. She had to live in a leper colony. And every time someone came near to her, she would have to yell, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine the complex? Can you imagine the complex? Miss Judy, you were a social worker. Can you imagine if you dealt with people and every time someone came near them, they, they were, their responsibility was to yell unclean so they didn't get close. The complex that would have put on people. She's beaten down emotionally. She spent all of her savings. She, she did everything. She's been separated from her family. She doesn't get to see her little girl. She doesn't get to rock her little girl. She doesn't get to put her little girl in bed. 12 years she's had this issue of blood. 
And finally she realized, I better get to Jesus or I'm never gonna get out of this mess. She started hearing about this one named Jesus and finally she just touched the hem of his garment. And boy, when she touched that garment, it changed her life. Can I tell you this? If you ever really get a hold of Jesus, it will change your life. And people that say, well, I've been saved and, and I, I know the Lord and I'm a member of the church. If you're still exactly like you were pre-Jesus, then I just wonder if you really got Jesus. Because when I got saved, it changed me. Uh, there, there's an old song that used to say, that go like this, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. The things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. There's been a change. You see, what, what happens is God changes your heart. You say, well, God looks on the heart and man looks on the outside. Don't judge me. Can I just say this? When God really changes your heart, the outside starts to change. It's not anybody judging. It's just saying God starts changing and it's obvious to everybody, usually except the person who's not being changed. I thought that was good preaching too, Nate. Thanks. Can I move on a little bit further? When you're all done, God's not when it comes to needing a second chance. I'm glad God saves and helps and forgives people that mess up. Because if not, I'd be done. But I love what the Bible says. It says, a just man falleth seven times, yet riseth again. See, we, we got a bunch of people out there that want to preach this Lordship salvation, that if you ever make a mistake and when you get saved, you, you, you become perfect. And by the way, can I just say this? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're, we're new creatures, but it doesn't mean we don't carry around that old flesh. We still pack that old flesh around and it's a fight. Maybe your flesh don't ever try to rise up, but mine does every now and then. You, you, you let my wife watch a North Carolina Duke game and you'll see that old flesh rise up in her. I mean, she will, and she's a Tar Heel fan from the top of her head to the sole of her feet. And I mean, that old Duke, or you, you, you let her watch a little Kentucky game when they're playing North Carolina. She'll be texting people. I'm like, just stop that. What if you lose? I don't care. We're not going to lose. <laughs> and then they may lose, and she's like in depression. She goes and gets in the bed and covers her head up. I said, I told you, you shouldn't be texting and putting it on Facebook. <laughs> but that old flesh just rises up. Maybe y'all don't ever have that, but I do. Bubba, I, I looked at my class reviews from, uh, look, looked at my, my, my class reviews from my class I teach at Southern. Talk about getting depressed. You'll have 35 or 40 kids and only like seven of them will do the review and then three of the seven hate you. So I gotta listen to an 18 year old tell me how terrible I am. I mean, you're a terrible communicator. Basically the dumbest man I've ever met. And, and one will say something like this. We love the personal illustrations about people being saved that helped us to see we could do it. The next one will say we absolutely hated the personal illustrations. All he does is think about himself. One will say we loved how he would start each one with a sermon and encourage us. The other one would say, I hate his preachy attitude. You talk about wanting to get depressed. I mean, I tied the rope several times, but I couldn't figure out how to make a noose or I'd have killed myself. I mean, it's depressing. I'm serious. Now, now listen to me. Sometimes situations, you, you need a second chance. You can get depressed. You can get discouraged. You can get down. You can mess up. Parents, I don't know if you've ever had to do this, but I've had to make things right with my kids before. Because I'm not a perfect parent. Come here, Wes. <laughs> Poor kid. Brother Roger, this is, this is my oldest son. And I, I know he's not much to look at, but he's a nice kid. <laughs> he's really nice. And uh, Wesley, don't come with a deep voice. We know it's changing right now. You might come out with the cow voice. But there's been some times where I've... I've wanted Wesley to do something and I've been too harsh or he's done something and I, I just think it's I mean I I didn't grow I'm gonna be honest I didn't grow up with video games and I, I'm, I'm, I don't don't hate me but I th they just don't make sense to me 
I mean, instead of playing a game, I like joined the army. You know, got to jump out of airplanes for real. I don't like come down with a wolf skin on and whatever. What game is that? Fortnite. Fortnite. <laughs> I don't dress up like a wolf. But anyway. <clears throat> so so here, here's the deal. Now stay with me. So the other day, man, I, I was like, bro, what are you doing? Uh, I, was, I was playing a little game. And, and honestly, I said too much. And I went back to him. I said, I'm sorry. Dad, Dad shouldn't have said that. I was wrong. And I didn't have a right spirit about it when I said it. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Man, you should never turn that game system on. Brother Roger, I told him accountable with his uh, with the devotions. I said, y'all have your devotions before you started playing? No. Brother Junior, I said, have y'all, have y'all read your Bible and done this other stuff? No. And so I, I came down pretty hard. Now, does a dad need to teach his sons that they should first spend time with the Lord before they spend time with uh, Xbox or Sega Genesis? Do we still have Sega Genesis? <laughs> Nintendo One? Um, no. But can I say this? I had to get some things right. And I, I hope that he'll give me a second chance. Because God gives us a second chance. So, so, some of y'all, you're, you're missing the illustration, but you need a second chance just like I do and just like he does. And God's given you one. That's why he put in the Bible, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he knows that, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags and all we like sheep have gone astray and we all mess up. But that's why we come to church and we hold each other accountable and we encourage each other and we hear the preaching from God's word and we hear the singing and it uplifts our spirits and then we say, you know what, it's another week and it's gonna be tough, but I can face it. I, I, I gotta hurry and, I, and I'm almost done. I love the way this... When sickness is in our bodies, she's sick and the little girl's sick, sickness in the, in the woman, sickness in the little girl, sickness unto death. Brother Gooden, and I, I, I've just got a couple minutes left and I'm, I'm gonna be done, so stay with me. It's not, it's not noon yet. It's about one minute till, so just settle down. That clock's wrong. Um, don't y'all dare look back on that back wall. I'll throw a hymn book at you. That's the only thing we use them for anymore is throwing them because we don't usually really, you know, use them anymore. But now stay with me. I, you got to get this. this is, I, want, I want you to see this. Brother Gooden was a, a lay preacher in our church, Brother Junior. And this guy, he, he was 70 years old. He had stage four liver cancer. They called him in. They said he was going to die. I guess they pushed on his fingernails, Miss Donna, and his fingernails like didn't turn white again, or they turned white, I don't know what it was, but they said, you, you know, they told his wife, like, you're gonna die. He's gonna die. His heart rate was down, everything was down, and I remember I went running up there to his room, I drove uh, several 50, 60 miles, I got up to his room in the ICU, and I, 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 all these different signs to test, I mean, his heart, his oxygen level, everything's gone, I mean, he's just gonna die. And so, man, I started praying with him, and he said, I'm not gonna die till God says it's time for me to die. I said, now, Doc, listen, bro. Doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> you just be prepared if the Lord calls you. Oh, I'm gonna, man, I'm ready to go, Pastor Mark. I'm ready, man. I'm ready to shout. I'm ready to sing. I'm ready. But God didn't tell me I'm going to die yet. Now, brother, goodness, it's going to be okay, man. You just, you just let the Lord have his way. He said, look, when God's done, he'll take me. And maybe he is, maybe he's not. Closed his eyes. We, I mean, his breathing was so shallow. He was yellow. The liver cancer, he was so yellow. We, we, I mean, he was done. A month later, I was out of town, and he was preaching for me on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Lived three or four more years. Went and preached at churches around in the area and told about his testimony. Can, can I just say this? If you're facing cancer, if you're facing sickness, if you've got a family member facing that today, it's not over till God says it's over. When you're done, God's not. You gotta give God a chance because he's still God. And you say, well, this is just a really good chapter in the Bible. Can, can I just, can I say something to you right now? This is New Testament for you. We give up when God hasn't. Let me give you this last one. When we're done, God's not when it comes to our situation being bigger than us. 
<clears throat> now, now think about this. Sometimes we get overwhelmed. Maybe you've been facing this situation so long that you're depressed, you're discouraged, you've given up hope. Maybe your finances are so bad, you don't have anything left, and you don't know how you're going to pay the bills, and rent's due. Maybe your phone's cut off now, and the tags are expired on your car, and you just hope you don't get picked up when you go out of the parking lot. Maybe your marriage is broken up. Maybe your kids have gone astray. Maybe you've got somebody in your family running from God. I don't know, but here's what I can tell you. Now listen to me, and I'm almost done. When it's spinning out of control, God's not. Now, <clears throat> stay with me. I, my daddy, years ago, preached out of this passage of Scripture, and I've never forgotten this, and I just want to share it with you because it encouraged my heart. Do you know that God wants what's best for you? He wants what's best for you. And so <clears throat> here's God. Now here's God and I'm done. Brother Doug, could it be? Very few cases ever, Brother Junior, did God tell how long a warm woman or a man was sick. And there was only one case in the Bible where he told how old the person was. And they both happened to be in the same story. How long had the woman had the issue of blood? How long... Or how old was the little girl? Could it be? I, 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 just could it be, Brother Gary, that this woman heard about her little girl who was sick? Now remember, she hadn't got to go home for 12 years. She was cast out of the camp, yelling unclean. Could it be that she heard about her little girl that was gonna die and she thought, the only chance I've got is Jesus. And then maybe I can see my little girl and help nurse her back to health. So she's running to her little girl's house, and on the way, she runs into Jesus, touches the hem of his garment. Then Jesus gets to the house. She's, little girl's dead. Now remember, 12 years, and, and she just got to come back and see her little girl die. That was it. But Jesus said, no, that's not enough. And I'll never, I was a teenage boy when my daddy told this. I mean, I got chill bumps big enough you could hang a piglet off of them. And he said, maybe mama got to see that little girl and walked in and she is dead and mama fell across her crying and Jesus said, now hold on. It's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right, mama. It's gonna be okay. Raise that little girl up from the dead. It's interesting. I think this is one of the only passages where it says eat. Wouldn't it be just like God, brother Brad, to let them have their first family dinner together? after 12 years. He said, well, I, you don't know that it happened that way. I don't. But I can tell you this, it's all in the same flow of the story. And I can tell you this, that would be like God. When you don't think you can ever get back to where you need to be, God can bring you there. Some of you, you've wandered, you haven't been in church, maybe your life's been messed up, you've gone down a bad path, you've gotten involved in things you didn't want to, you got involved in things you know you shouldn't have, but God's speaking to you today. Let, let me, he can put you back together in one second. God can do more in a minute than you can do in a lifetime. Trying to fix and trying to turn around and trying to go to this and trying to go to that, just let God have it. You say, well, I'm all done. He's not. Let him have it. He will change your life today if you'll just give it to him with heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you sick? Spiritually, physically? Are you hurting? Are you broken? Are you wounded? Are you carrying something today that's bigger than you? That's all right. Because God can get it if you'll give it to him. I think about parents who have kids that are at the age that they need to be saved. I remember what it's like having a child that reaches the age of accountability that hasn't come to Christ yet and the prayers I've prayed for them over and over and over and I've got a little girl about to go off to college and the prayers I'm praying for her and, and I think about church members who are wounded, who have problems, who have hurts. I know some of you, your hurt is so big but, but we know that God can. Maybe you need to get on an altar and say, Lord, we, we just want you to do what you can do because I've done all I can do. He can and he will. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm gonna ask just, just two questions and I'm done. No one looking around. Pastor Mark, I'm not sure that if I were to die today that I would, I would go to heaven. I, I don't know the Lord personally as my Savior. I, 
there's never been a time I've turned from my sin and given my life to the, to the Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. Is there anyone like that that would say, that's me this morning? Just slip your hand up and let me pray for you. Is there one like that? Just let me pray for you. I'm not gonna come to you and embarrass you. Thank you, I see that hand. You can put it down. Is there someone else? I see that hand. Thank you, you can put it down. Is there someone else? Anyone else can pray for you this morning? Just let me see for you. I, I wanna pray for you. Anyone else? Here's the second question I'm gonna ask, and I'm finished. And by the way, if you just raised your hand, if you wanna come and get that settled this morning, I'll meet you right down here at the front. We'll show you how you can know. Here's the second question, and I'm finished. Pastor Mark, I've got something going on I can't fix. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's health. Maybe it's your job situation. I don't know what it is, but you've got something you can't fix. And you'll just own it this morning. Pastor Mark, there's something in my life that I'm dealing with that's bigger than me. If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand up around the building? Slip it up all over the building, all over the building. Hold them up. There's lots of hands, lots of people being honest right now. Thank you, you can put them down. I'm gonna give this invitation. I want you just to come and give that to the Lord this morning. And say, God, I need you to take this. Father in heaven, I pray that you would work in our midst. Lord, I pray as we give this service to you that it would be yours and we wouldn't take it back, Lord, when we give it to you, our burdens, our heartache, our shame, our pain, our sin, Lord, we would leave it with you. Lord, you bring us healing. Lord, you take that situation, that sickness out of our body, that sorrow that we're suffering with, and Lord, you would turn it around into joy. God, you can. Lord, even though we're done, it doesn't mean you are. Lord, I pray that you would win the day in our hearts, win the day in this place.